Welcome back to our Bible study for Wednesday night. We're excited to have you with us tonight. We're going to do a few things differently tonight. We're going to share a couple of video clips here in just a few moments, and I'll try to set them up as, as quickly as I can. Uh, the first two clips that you're going to see are sports clips, meaning these are about athletic events, and one of them will be really familiar to you, and the other one will probably be something that some of you will remember, maybe not everybody, but I'll set it up this way. I'm an Atlanta Braves fan from way back. And I struggled with them through the 80s and watched them just get beat up all the time. But when the 90s came, all of a sudden things started turning around and they were able to make the playoffs, made it to the championship series uh, for, their, for their division and for the National League. And they were playing against the Pittsburgh Pirates in Game 7. They were in Atlanta. It was exciting. It was the bottom of the ninth inning, so it was the last inning, last, last half inning. And uh, we had runners on base. I say runners. We had a runner, Sid Bream, and uh, he was at second. Now, I'm told by people that if, if Sid Bream got into a race with a pregnant woman, he'd probably finish third. So he wasn't like fast or anything like that. Uh, but we were still excited that we had a shot. Well, they brought up uh, Francisco Cabrera to be a pinch hitter for the pitcher. And so I remember being at Faulkner University in the dorm lobby with about 30 people watching this game and it was high intensity and well, I'll just let the video clip speak for itself. He doesn't walk much. He walked only 17 times and 300 at bats in AAA this year. He hacked at the 2-0, now the 2-1. Line drive and a base hit! Just as the score of the tying run, bring to the plate! And he is safe! Safe at the plate! The Braves go to the World Series! Van Tiffen won, kicked one from 52 yards in 1985. One of the legendary moments in the Iron Bowl history. And here is a red shirt freshman from Calhoun, Georgia. Very little wind. What small amount there is, is at his back. Mandel will hold it. Now they've officially made it. 57 yards. Remember a block kick to go the other way, too. He's got to be careful and get it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He missed the field goal and they scored. Whatever. Anyway, let's move on to stuff that's really a little bit more impactful on life. I want to share with you a couple more videos that, that really are the kind that build anticipation and expectation and get us really excited. Uh, but they're the kinds of things that really do change our world. Oh, I We have two boxes because we're having two babies. Oh my gosh! Two, three, one, go! 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 And welcome home. Thank you. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. Okay, go over. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the main. It really looks great. So in moments like these, when you see these video clips, I know it takes you back. It brings you to that level of pride or excitement or joy. And uh, we have this, 
this great expectation for what is going to happen because the moment is just so big in that time frame. So I want us to talk a little bit about being on the edge of our seat, not just for those kinds of things, but on the edge of our seat for what God is doing in our lives. I want us to talk a little bit about eager expectation. And the truth is there are a lot of passages in the Bible that really help us see uh, this excitement about serving God, the joy of, of knowing that He's out there. Even when things are out there that we don't have the answer of how things are going to go, just seeing that God is still at work. I want to share with you a couple of those passages. This first one comes from Isaiah chapter 40, and it's a very familiar passage. You've heard it before. But it says this, Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I don't know what that passage does for you, but it's one that has always just excited me. It's made me so thrilled to think about what all God can do when we put our trust in Him. The God of the universe loves you, is aware of what you're going through in your life, no matter what it is. And right now we know what everybody's going through. But He's aware of those things. He's aware of the challenges in front of you. And yet He says to us through the prophet Isaiah that we need to trust in Him and, and that we need to wait on Him and know that through that process, He's going to lift us up. He's going to make us str stronger. and He's going to keep us from fainting. He's going to keep us empowered. And I've, it's always been a passage that I've really enjoyed. But there are others. Let me set the stage on this one. In Joshua chapter 3, Joshua has taken over the leadership of the Israelites, and, and they are on their way headed toward Jericho. They come to the Jordan River, and they take about three nights to, to spend the night. And the final night that they're there, Joshua calls all the people together and he says this. He says, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now that's exciting. I don't know if that's cheerleading or what it is, but there was confidence in Joshua's voice. And what he was saying to all the people is, Prepare yourself. Get ready to experience something amazing. Well, what we know is, Joshua marched those Israelites across the Jordan on dry ground. God pulled the waters back just as he'd done for the Red Sea. So if that wasn't enough to walk across the Jordan, uh, just imagine what they would have seen when they went to Jericho and for six days marching around that wall one time each day and then on the final day, that seventh day, marching around the wall seven times for the walls to fall down at God's power. Uh, just an unbelievable time, and Joshua was preparing them uh, in advance for what they were going to see. See, God is giving us a reason to have eager expectation. Psalm 62, it says, Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. Let all that I am. Are each of us giving all that we have for God? It's not meant to make anybody feel guilty, but just think about and ask yourself the question, am I giving my all to God? Am I really fully trusting in Him? But then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, the gospel is a new thing to the Gentile world, and, and for people who had never seen the love of God expressed in the way the gospel did with Jesus dying for us, uh, it was an amazing thing. And it was something that maybe they had never imagined before. And so Paul says this, he says, But as it is written... What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. And I know our mind immediately goes to things like heaven and an eternal reward. But I think even in the context of this passage, God is saying, just open your eyes to things that you have never imagined that would happen because you trust in me. And then finally, in Micah chapter 7, verse 7, it says, but as for me, and I love the terminology here, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do you hear the confidence? Do you hear the expectation? Do you hear the on the edge of your seat knowing that, that God is there, that He is going to listen, that He is going to care about what we're going through, and that He's going to answer us? 
And you know, we don't know what God is always going to be doing. But how wonderful is it to know that He's in control and that He's the one that's driving the ship. So eager expectation is something I think I want us to talk about just a little bit more uh, today. I want to give us a couple of things to think about. First of all, this encouragement from the Apostle Peter. He's talking to Christians who were going through unbelievable persecution. And, and in that struggle, uh, you know, finding their faith and holding on to it and being strong in the midst of all those persecutions was, was something that was really challenging for them. And so he says this to them in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again, get what He says, to a living hope. That means something that still lives inside of us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So something that we can look forward to, that we can anticipate, that we can have an expectation of. He says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, we're going to go through difficult circumstances. And these times right now, we're going through a, a bit of a trial. Uh, and I think uh, those of us who are finding ourselves at home a little bit more are also finding the blessing of it. We're also seeing the opportunities that we're having with our family, the, the opportunity to sit around a table and enjoy a good meal together, uh, to play cards, to just laugh and have a great time. Uh, even through the trials, there's a way for us to hope for something better. There's a way for us to anticipate and have an eager expectation for something more. It goes on to say, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And again, that's something that Peter is trying to remind them that hey, you can't have a short distance view of this. You've got to be looking toward eternity and to recognize that these things are going to uh, be challenging. They're going to be difficult to go through. But on the other side of this is a faith that's tested and genuine and strong and powerful. And as a result, the encouragement they receive from this is knowing that their faith will drive them to a relationship with God that will bring them salvation. Just such an encouraging and comforting passage of scripture. But then I also want to talk to us a little bit about another great example. Uh, Paul was talking to the church at Thessalonica and he's writing a letter to them and he is sharing with them just how proud he is of what they've gone through. Now this is the same place where, where uh, you know, Paul and Silas had to leave town uh, in the middle of the night. They, they were so persecuted and they were always being brought in and, and put before the uh, officials of the city. And uh, they were basically causing a disturbance because of the way they were teaching. And it's under this persecution that, that uh, Paul writes this to them. Even though they may have been a little bit hesitant about just jumping in fully. He says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love. And listen to the words here, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, what he's saying to them is, we're just proud of you. We're so thankful that even through the, the midst of this persecution, of the, these afflictions, these, these things that are going on around you that are, are very difficult to, to go through, you still found a way to, to set an example and to, to show to other people how, how to exhibit that faith in God and how to trust in Him. 
goes on to say, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Can you imagine talking to a body of people, a church family, and saying to them, Hey, I'm just so proud of you, and your example is so great that, that even people in this region, they know that you're the people who teach the gospel. You're the ones who are sharing the message of Jesus Christ. But not only that, but your depth of faith is so uh, visible to people that they see it and they're inspired by what you're doing. But we don't have to say anything about whether or not you guys are in the faith because your example is so strong that people can see it in your lives. Folks, let's ask ourselves a question. When someone says, do you know someone at the Madison Church of Christ? Do they think, oh, those are, those are people that, man, they, they know their Bible, they're, they're really, we're willing and ready always to share an example from scriptures or maybe even teach someone or, you know, I've seen them in Bible studies with people before. They really seem to care about their faith. Do they look at us and go, you know, the people that go to that church, man, their faith is so strong. I've seen them in the midst of difficulties and they just always seem to have something else that keeps them focused and centered and grounded. Man, I hope that that's the reputation that all of us have. That in our communities and around the people that we know and love, that they look at us and they see not only are we willing to share God's word, but we're also willing to let our faith be uh, a standard for people to look at and to see uh, how we all need to live. What a great example Paul gives us here. But then I want us to think about eager expectation. Okay, and I want us to, to really, I want to give you four or five things to think about that I believe maybe help us just understand the idea of God at work and that, that all, we have a part to play in it, that we have a, a way to, to not only believe what God has said, but we trust in what He's doing and that we keep our eyes open with eager expectation of how He's going to work His will in our lives. So I want to encourage us, first of all, to know who God is. Psalm 33, 20 through 22 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. And when I think about that, the concept of waiting for the Lord. Um, if I read this passage well enough, then what I'm getting is that it's my responsibility to fall in subjection to Him. My soul waits for the Lord. In other words, God doesn't, He's not a vending machine. We don't just throw out our expectations for God and, and ask Him to provide those things. We can ask those things and believe uh, that we need those things and we can uh, be re even receiving those things. But just understand that we're not in the place of God. We, we fall under His authority. But when we do that, it's interesting because He says He is our help and He's our shield. And our gladness is found in Him. And when we trust in Him, we have this steadfast love that He provides for us. And as a byproduct of that, we gain more hope in Him. It's just all in this one text. So first of all, to have this eager expectation about life and to know what God's doing, we got to first know who God is. Secondly, we want to um, eagerly expect. This is a passage that we sing all the time, and it's one of my favorite songs. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him. To the soul who seeks Him, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. That's Lamentations chapter 3, 22 through 26. Eagerly expect. Psalm 5 verse 3, Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. Think about how this would be if every single day as we got up in the morning, we put our request before God, knowing that He is going to unfold things in a way that are powerful and that if we'll just keep our eyes open and watch, that we can see Him at work in the things that are going on. Just the idea of waiting expectantly. I hope that we can all develop that pattern of thinking. 
The next thing, uh, not only do we need to know who God is and uh, eagerly uh, wait, uh, we need to eagerly work. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Just prior to this, the Bible tells us that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works lest anyone should boast or brag about those things. The works themselves are not what bring us the salvation. But because of what God has done for us, it makes sense that He is putting opportunity in front of us all the time. And if each of us will just open our eyes and be eager to, uh, to work and to do those things that He's put in front of us, to be a blessing to other people, to use the principles that we already know to bless other people, we will fulfill this passage in Ephesians chapter 2. But then, just as a reminder, Philippians 2.13 says that it, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. God is doing some amazing things. And so you want to be a part of that and He wants us to work and He will work through us. And then finally, we need to be careful that we don't put limitations on God. Listen to this passage that we're familiar with. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To just think about how God is so much greater than even our imagination. That the works that we're doing, that God can take those things and magnify them in ways that we never even imagined. Just that's the edge of your seat. That's sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for God to do something amazing. And then finally, eagerly wait. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And it's interesting, he says it twice. To stop and just trust. To give your confidence to God and know that He's going to take care of you. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. There are going to be lots of times where you do not know what God is doing. There are going to be a lot of times that you find yourself just questioning, where is this all going? Why are things the way they are? And you may be frustrated and you may be discouraged. But again, he says, my hope is in you. I don't know what I'm waiting for, but my hope is in you, Lord. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. God has given us what we need already to to know everything that we need to know that pertains to life and godliness through a knowledge of Christ. He's also given us everything we need in Scripture for, for uh, doctrine, reproof, uh, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we can be complete. He's given us all the things that we need for that. So what he's saying is, wait for me and trust in what I've told you already. These are great passages. And then finally this one. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Now, as I think about this, and I've got this picture up here, and it's more than just a background. When I look at it, I see a road, and it's heading to a, a horizon. And we don't know what's on the other side of that horizon. We don't know what's coming. But I want you to notice that in this picture, there is sunlight on one side and there's a storm on the other. Because the reality is, as we go through life, there are going to be great days and there are going to be days that are really difficult to go through. But the concept of waiting on God, trusting in Him, and even through the storms, knowing that He is going to take care of us and we can put our trust in Him and He's going to let things unfold. And we can be on the edge of our seat looking forward to just how God is going to work. Tonight we're going to finish up a little bit differently as well. I wanted to to share a song with you. It's one that we learned in our singing class a few months back. And I want you to, to stay with us, continue to, to stay um, on this live stream. And I'd love for you to sing along with it. It's a beautiful song called I Will Wait For You. I
darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me anew, and hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Were you to count my sinful ways, how could I come before your Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us. You work in ways that are outside of our understanding, Father. You're so wise and you're so wonderful. Father, we pray that you'll help us to be eager and to expect that you are working in our lives, for us to open our eyes and to see you all around us, for us to see the opportunities that you put before us, for us to be able to, to anticipate the goodness and the blessings that you provide for us. But also, Father, when we go through these difficult times to know that even through these challenges, you are working with us and you are helping us and you're navigating us through that. And, Father, through our, our persistence and, and staying strong, that you're going to give us a deeper faith and a deeper trust in you, one that is an example to people in our community, but even people who are afar off. Father, we pray for that hope, for that expectation, for that, that anticipation of what you're going to provide for us. Help us now, Father, to develop the faith, to live for you every day. We thank you so much for times like this where we can open up your word and learn from it. And Father, we pray that you just help us to apply it and to move forward in our lives, giving our all to you and waiting for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll see you again on Sunday at 1030.